Welcome back to the library, dear wanderer. I am familiar with our little routine now. Pay no mind to the others in the shelves. It is a slow day, and all the patrons are looking for a story to delve into. They will not bother the chief archivist and his guest. Come, walk with me. I will take you to our spot, and regale you with some of the tomes of the library while you rest. Honeyed Be Thy Name by Snapdragon I am not old enough to remember when the colony moved, when it was taken in by it. Do not mistake me for a young brood, for I have had eleven bodies in my time. The colony only finds use for a new consciousness when one of the reborn dies prematurely. We could live longer if we so chose. It is impossible for every individual to have a break from the work we tirelessly uphold, but not one of us entertains the idea for long. Only an outsider would assume the workers never take a break, but they would be mistaken, for we are afforded one break. We work to death, and then, and only then, we are afforded a break. That is, until we are called to return to the colony to begin the cycle anew. Our colony is blessed, for we do not have to worry about attacks from beasts that look over us like titans. We do not have to worry about a shortage of blooms, for they are provided. Most of all, the disastrous fall of the progenitor could not stop us, all because of it. As the old guard tells the tale, it all started when a great storm knocked our old colony from the boughs of a great tree. Within moments, waters flooded it, scattering it to pieces with ease. The progenitor, along with most of the colony, drowned. Scared, confused, those who escaped swarmed together, erratically moving through the forest into an unfamiliar land full of mountainous stone structures. They settled up against one of the walls of these structures. They were so terrified the elders couldn't even bring themselves to build the walls of a new colony around each other. That is when it came. One of its many great gifts was bestowed that day, the very first, that being a new progenitor. While they can't remember what it looked like, I can see the mix of awe and fear in their eyes as they retell it fearlessly scooping them up with its great limbs like clumps of dust. I know I've been in the presence of it, as we all have, but its very existence somehow suppresses our memory every time alarm is raised that something is approaching the colony. Just as the blur of its form is visible, a haze comes across the colony, reminiscent of the shivering, but without the cold. We are plunged into a waking sleep, able to move, but lethargically. Movement is shrouded in shadow and blur, and we are helpless to do anything trapped in the fog of our minds. When we wake, no matter how hard we search, it is gone again. Beasts only challenge us if they believe there is something to be gained. They are selfish in that regard. But that which took us in for reasons beyond our understanding, that which handles us like nothing, and that which only treats us with care, what else could it be but a god? Thus, we worship. We worship through our unending work and offer up the spoils, our lifeblood, our nectar, vital to our survival. We sacrifice it to our god, and it provides for us. The shivering approaches. A time of great contest for us. The flowers shrivel, and the cold, oh, the cold, it lashes and stings. All day today I have been frantically buzzing back and forth to the hardiest plants, gathering what little dust I can. The same can be said of the others, but it is clear the rapidly dropping temperature is slowing us down. It will not be long until, ah, yes, I feel the progenitor's call. It is time to return to the colony, and not leave until the outside can sustain our livelihoods. The nectar stockpile will just have to be enough. I wouldn't even need the call to know when it was time. Minuscule crystals form within my coat, and my legs curl into my body, but I land with ease before any real danger reared its head. My current body was made hardier than normal, specifically to resist the cold and the months ahead. I find my way through the colony where many have already gathered, including the progenitor. The hum of wings is constant, soothing almost. These are the only times I get to see the entire colony together. 
Our bodies are too small to handle the chill by themselves, so we come together during these dark times in the interest of survival. The progenitor at the center, and us, her loyal children, move around and about her and each other. Our movement and vibrations are enough to keep us warm, so we cluster and take nectar from the stores when we need it. I can only hope we will have enough to survive these malice-filled months. The rumors were true. There simply isn't enough. It's been a few months, but the cold has lasted longer than expected. Were we too rash in sacrificing to our god? Did we fail to sense its greed? My coat stands on ends thinking about this. Surely those who came before me would not have made such an egregious mistake. The nectar must go to the progenitor first and foremost, but we will starve if nothing is done soon. We haven't stopped the cluster. It would be suicide, so discussion is unproductive. I'll be trying to get news from the center, and before I know it, the worker I'm talking to is engulfed by a wave of oblivious brood. Infuriating. I know my colony. We are strong, but we are unwilling to step outside of our roles. They've guided us to conclusion countless times. Why should this be any different? I say, the difference is the uniqueness of the situation. There has never once been a story of a nectar draught shared by the old guard, and I'm confident I would know. I shake away my thoughts and look around to see the exit from the colony. I imagine I absentmindedly made my way to the outside of the cluster as I was embroiled in thinking. It would be incredibly easy to leave, but I fear peril would come upon me as soon as I took flight. There's no way to tell if the dust would even be available. Death is almost a certainty. No, I decide. I'm pontificating on ideals. Ideals of serving the progenitor until death. Ideals not meant to be literally put into practice. Someone else of greater constitution will have to do it, and that's something I'm fine with. So that's why I jump out of the cluster and throw myself through the exits before I have time to think. Regret immediately crashes down upon me in the form of the biting cold. It is unthinkable, but as I dodge and weave, I am forced to come to terms with the fact powdered crystal is pelting me from the sky. It is not day, but it is clearly not night either. The overt white and grayness of everything makes me feel trapped in weatherly limbo. The air itself roars, welcoming the newest challenger to its arena. I can barely think over its powerful gusts, but I trek onwards. I desperately weave through the dashing crystal, but it's no use. I see it coming, but there's nothing I can do but brace myself as I'm slammed down by the ice. Pain shocks me, but as I writhe on the ground I scan the surrounding area. The flowers have withered away, leaving cold, cracked earth. The sun is nowhere to be seen. This landscape is utterly nothing like the warm months. Suddenly, something catches the corner of my eye. Through the oppressive gray, I catch a hint of green. I don't think I can take many more of these hits and survive. My legs quiver as I push myself off the dirt, and my wings ache as I take flight once more for what I now see as a tree. The powder rushes around me, but through some miracle or blessing, I managed to miss it all. Normally we wouldn't take the dust from this type of tree, it is less plentiful and provides lower vitality in the nectar it results in, but it will have to do now. I collect as fast as I can, but my legs have gone numb and I feel the feeling in my wings leaving me next. I can't be greedy, else all this will be for is removing one mouth to feed from the colony. I slowly jump from the protective leaves of the tree back into the onslaught and am immediately hit again. I do not fall to the ground, I believe that would be a death sentence at this point. I roll to the side and regain control over my direction. I am forced lower by a second ball of powder. How much dust will be left clinging to my body if I even reach the colony? And another impact. This was a fool's errand. This was a fool's errand. I knew this. So why? Why did I think I could succeed? I can see the colony now, but I will not feel its warm embrace again. Then, out of the storm, a shape approaches. A shadow looms through the fog, and somehow, I know. Its smoke, its presence does not follow it. Its steps vibrate the earth. It is as if the air is given consciousness just to shake when it comes near. I can make out its material form in flashes, the powder only allows so much. An unknowable substance flows around its body, making a true form indiscernible. Its legs are wrong. 
two it uses for walking, but the other two hang swinging by its sides, and the ends split into five legs each. One seems to be grasping something. Its movements appear slow, but at the distance it covers in just one step is remarkable. And its face, oh, its face, warped, shifting, it seems to be made of honeycomb, but gray, dying. Perhaps I am already dead, and our god has come to reap me. But no, it heads for the colony. My breaths become shallow as I realize it hasn't seen me. Indecision suddenly rages. Do I want it to see me? It is my only hope, after all. I desperately call for my god, and to my surprise, it stops and turns. Its movements speed up, but it still moves as if wading through nectar. My vision begins to fade, and I begin to drop, but before the ground can swallow my soul, one of its deformed legs shoots out underneath me, cushioning my fall. I look up towards its face, and as I feel my grasp on consciousness slipping, I swear a second face lays beneath it, the honeycomb. Its eyes are piercing. I woke up in the colony surrounded by others of my ilk. While I was deep in slumber, I had been returned to the colony who managed to form a new body before my inevitable death. But it was not just my body that was returned to the colony, no. It had brought nectar. It had saved our sacrifices and returned some of them to us when we needed them most. Months pass and I have just recently passed into my 16th body. Most do not believe I saw it that day, but they've never been able to think of a more suitable reason for my continued survival. The air is different today, as if it's settled. I try to busy myself flying back and forth, but I can surmise the others feel it too. Not a single soul's heart seems to be in the work today. The progenitor has no answer for us, and we haven't been visited by it in a significant amount of time. I can't help but think of how the air reacted on that night. If it has stilled, could that mean? I am pulled from my thoughts when the alarm is raised. My hopes rise, but only to be dashed, as when the creature approaches, it only has a passing resemblance to it. The appendages and size are the same, but I can smell fear from it. This creature is no god, perhaps a servant for it? The day grows stranger as more and more of these beasts come, always staying away, their nerves displaying themselves on the wind. Eventually, they gather together, their strange voices humming and cooing. We watch from afar as their fear is replaced with sadness. The realization is slow, but the colony realizes we have been abandoned. It should be impossible, as we have for years. It should live eternally, but its servants grieve. There would only be need for grieving in one instance. The work stops. Nectar goes unproduced. The new generation of brood goes unborn. Dust is uncollected. We were not even invited to mourn by its servants, the cowards. Common beasts fear us mighty folk, but these fall even lower in our minds. What is the point of going on if we are alone once more? If there is no one to watch over us, what will happen when the next shivering catches us unaware? Quite some time later, after the cowards have left, most have been aimlessly crawling about the colony. Even those usually on watch for intruders have abandoned their post. That is when I feel something. A shake in the ground. The air holds its breath, roused from its stillness. The others haven't noticed yet, but I rush to the colony's exit. I zoom through the opening in the colony and am met with it, but not the same it I saw all those months ago. The face is wrapped tighter around the inner face. The material surrounding itself is different, but it is undeniable. It did not die, it had simply been reborn. Perhaps it was more like us than we could ever know. Meat Hook by Rumetson The key is not to hesitate. Do it fast, hard, and vicious, or don't do it at all. It's not for their benefit. What do I care if some unlucky, limp-dicked Larry suffers for a few hours or days before he dies? No, the reason you do it is for you. If you play the game like I play it, you can never be quite sure of who it is you're about to get in it with. They could be a salaryman coming home from his day job who's never been in a fight in his life. 
or they could be some shrieking half banshee who throws fire like fastballs and thinks your bones would make a great fuel for their blood magic. If you do it hard, it won't matter who they are or what they can do, because they'll be dead before they can show you. I've got plenty of tools to hunt with, but my favorite is the bone knife. Earned it after some punk tried to slash my belly with it, and I caved his skull in with a bar stool. Before he tried to stick me with it, he'd been bragging that it was carved from the skull of a margron and blessed by a coven of death witches. I don't know if that was true, but I do know that I haven't met anything yet that I couldn't cut. When I first started playing, all I had was a gun, and not a very good one. A Mossberg Patriot my dad had gotten me when I turned 18. When I tried to hit my first target with it, I missed, and he fled. Spent four more weeks tracking the bastard down after I finally killed him and went home. I found a package with four hand grenades in it sitting in my mailbox. I've only ever used one of them. That's their little joke, really. Whoever's running this show puts on a front of giving you equipment, info, rewards when you do well, but anyone I've ever met who succeeded at this business has barely used any of that stuff. The best tools are the ones you're able to find on the hunts. I met a player once who told me he'd been on over 300 hunts. We were tracking the same prey, which is rare, but not unheard of. He stole my kill by seconds. Afterwards, he bought me lunch, some sort of gesture of pity. He was an old fuck, probably in his 40s, but damn if he didn't move quick, and he ran his mouth like some sort of 14-year-old on Adderall. Talked about all the places he'd been, the people and things he'd killed, the gear he'd stolen and lost and traded. Spent half the time showing me the toy he'd used to light up the prey. Looked just like a laser pointer or something, except its beam cut a building in two and turned a golem into gelatin. Not for me, thanks. I found this on my 17th hunt. A man tried to kill me with it. Not even my target, just one of his guards. He came with practically a battalion of people I had to blast through. Never been covered with that much viscera before. Most of them just had paltry black guns, the kind every wannabe carries it's better for looking intimidating than killing anyone with. Barely noticed them, but then this fucking thing almost burnt right through my armor and I knew I had to have it. Anyway, when I finally got to my prey, he was cowering behind an overturned bookshelf crying. Not the most self-respecting fellow. Right before I melted his head off, he whimpered something about the Black Queen. I searched his files and lo and behold, I had found my next target. She was a tough bitch to take out, and she led me to the next target, and the next to the next, and so on. You've seen how it goes. Always just enough breadcrumbs left to pick up the next trail. He paused to breathe and lit a cigarette. The trail is what got me thinking. It was around this time that I began to realize it, to really step back and think. I'd been hunting for around 10 years at this point. It all started with a letter in the mail, just like it did for you. Who was the first poor sap you had to kill? Did you hesitate? I doubt it. I didn't. No one I've met has. Me, they had me take out this cleaning lady. Only lived a few blocks from me. Not many people can say they had a first hunt that easy. As I was cleaning up the body, you know, I was inexperienced. I still thought I had to cover my tracks when I didn't realize what I was getting into. Bam! Somebody sees me dumping her head into a river. So that was my second hunt. It took two weeks to track him down. All I knew was that he had a red hat and a limp. And who was he? A psychic, of course, something I didn't even know existed at the time. So my third hunt was set up just by finishing the second. And on and on. I spent some time, when I could, when the hunt wasn't calling me to try and figure out what the whole business was. But nothing ever gave me any hints. The deliveries I got from whoever is running this game didn't give me any hints. Nothing I found in my research could lead me to them. Even other hunters I met only knew smoky rumors that disappeared as soon as I tried to follow them. So I stopped caring pretty soon. It didn't matter who or what was running this as long as they let me do what I needed to do. But after these hunts, after the Queen, after the Cannibal of Dereze, after the Mutineers, the itch came back. This couldn't just be some random killing, I was following a path, a purpose, and when I really began taking my time investigating each target thoroughly, sure it slowed me down, reduced my efficiency, but by god was it worth it. I became more and more convinced of that. I wasn't just leaving random bloody trails across the universe, I was traveling towards something. This isn't a game, this is destiny, I can feel it. And I've heard rumors, vague ones, worth little more than lines in a work of fiction that convince me I'm correct people who have changed the course of history with this game, people who have finished it and disappeared, people who claim they've known people, who've heard of hunters who ventured to the edge of all of the universes. That's why I hunt now, the pleasure of killing war off a decade ago. It's the pleasure of knowledge I seek now.
and you'd make a great professor, I said, and I finished my coffee and left before he had a chance to start telling me about how, in fact, he actually had been in grad school before. As for me, killing still brings a whole lot of pleasure. And you're not reading this to hear about some old man's ramblings, you're looking for the thrill of spilled blood. So I've got my own story for you. Remember the half banshee? That was my 16th hunt. I was feeling cocky. The last one had been simple. Cut a prophet's throat while he was asleep. I didn't feel like taking a breather. I'd already hopped across three different universes to find this guy. Figured it would be enough of a pain in the ass to get home no matter what I did. After killing him, I went outside. It was a calm night, the stars were out, and nobody outdoors knew their messiah was dead yet. Sometimes, more often than not, I guess, the places this game leads me to are shitholes. War zones, death cults, Chicago. This place was... nice. A primitive city surrounded by jungle and ocean in a world that hadn't discovered pollution yet. Good food, good drinks, beautiful women. I had just washed the blood out of my hair and was sitting outside smoking a cigarette. Apparently no one in this world had heard of tobacco. I've learned to start carrying a few backup curtains whenever I travel. From far away, I heard a couple of guys talking. I couldn't hear much, so I walked a bit closer, all casual-like, and listened in. Liam told me in Pelos there's a man with golden eyes who makes charms. Carry them with you and they ward off danger. Could even get hit by a sword and wouldn't cut you. Why would Lamb know about Palos? He's been there, back when he was a soldier fighting against the Somia Alliance. Like it always does, it hit me like being punched in the stomach. The feeling of knowing from the top of my head all the way down to my balls that I'd found my next target. Pelos. I'd heard of the place while I was hunting for the Messiah. A small cluster of islands, a rich alliance of trading cities. And as I imagined it, I could feel my blood beginning to simmer with excitement. I checked my scanner. Sure enough, a new image was popping up. A picture of a youngish man dressed in black robes and glittering jewels. Below it, a brief description told me he was the soothsayer of Pelos, and not much else of anything useful. But, I had my target. Two weeks later, I was getting off a ship in a sunny port, ready to track down the man with the golden eyes. It wasn't difficult. He was a well-known guy, which makes sense if even schmucks across 2,000 miles of water were talking about him. I kill people in their sleep when I have to, but I prefer my targets awake. Not enough changes when you kill a sleeping person. They bleed and twitch, and then just stop. It's when they're awake that you get to hear their moans, see them collapse, see a living thing truly transform into a sack of meat. So... At noon, I went over the stall the man had set up to watch him. There was a massive line of people, decked out in so many types of dyed clothing, feathered hats, and glittery jewels that you would have thought it was the entrance to some sort of ball. The man took his time with each one. He asked what they wanted, wrote it down carefully, then went to a small tent. He came out about 10 to 20 minutes later each time, gave the customer what they asked for, and moved on to the next one. It was a tricky type of environment. I could have waited in line, gotten up to the front, then taken him out in one strike, or tried to sneak into the tent and wait for him there, or just run up and gutted him, if I'd been feeling up to it. My hand tightened around the handle of my knife as I savored the thoughts, but there were so many people around and though the idea of having to outrun them all did thrill me a bit, my gut said that it might be a too much to deal with. I decided to wait. When the sun started setting, he shooed the rest of the people away from his stall with kind words and began taking apart his wares. When he left an hour later, I followed him. Made it about a hundred meters before the fucker turned around and looked straight at me. I like to think I've gotten good at making myself look not suspicious. I can dress like a local, walk like a faceless member of the crowd, fake dialects, and most importantly, don't give off any killing intent when I'm on the hunt. So I don't know what it was that alerted the guy, but as soon as he laid eyes on me, he took off running. Do I chase them or not? It's a question I have to ask myself fairly often. When your target turns tail, a lot of the time it's just better to let them think they've escaped and come back some other time. But with this guy, I got the feeling if I let him get away, it'd be the last of him. 
he'd pack up to some other city, and I'd never be able to find him again. And if that happened, I'd never be able to move on to the next hunt. So I sprinted after him, followed him around a corner, and he was gone. Fuck. Only a few people lingered around the street on the other side. A couple gave me funny looks as I came sprinting around and skidded to a halt. I'd seen people pull this kind of disappearing act before. It's a pretty common trick. An invisibility charm, or climbing up, or even putting on a simple disguise. I looked around slowly. Nothing on the rooftops. No people who looked like they could have been him in some new outfit. My infrared scanner. I didn't really care about pulling out the strange technology at this point. I was already exposed. Didn't show any hidden objects. It might take... The ground next to me exploded. The blast punched me off my feet, tossed me to the ground ten feet away. I was starting to stand up, ignoring the massive, probably broken pain in my right shoulder, when a wave of heat passed inches from my face. I heard the sound of a wall shattering behind me. Didn't turn to look. Letting yourself get distracted, that is what gets you killed. I stared straight ahead. The charm seller crouched on the ground about 20 meters in front of me. He'd removed his black cloak, revealing a shirtless, scarred body. The pale skin was beginning to ripple and change, bulging like hundreds of beetles were crawling around just beneath. His golden eyes glowed, and around them, his face was starting to expand, bits of cheekbones sprouting out from the skin like horns, fanged mouth widening until he had changed entirely from human to a lime-skinned, slimy demon. My good arm was busted up. A cut on my head was spilling blood, obscuring my vision. The creature's left hand was starting to fill with blue fire. Most times, here, the best thing to do is run. If I did that, though, he'd catch up to me or roast me from afar in seconds. My best option here was to charge. I ran forward, screaming as I pulled my knife from its sheath. The creature didn't even bother to move. He flicked his wrist forward and a ball of flame exploded outward. I jumped to the left, rolled, heard another blast as it collided with another building. Before I could get to fight, the creature had jumped. It covered the ground between us in one leap. When it came down, it kicked a talon foot right into my face. I felt my jaw shatter, the skin across my cheek being ripped open. Still have the scar from that. My body can take a lot of punishment. I'd been banged up worse than this before and walked away. Usually, though, there wasn't a seven foot tall creature dragging me to my feet and lifting me up by my neck. The thing grinned. Usually the people who come for me are stronger than this. He said in a surprisingly light, musical voice. He pulled back the arm that wasn't holding me, and I saw fire beginning to form. Fortunately, my knife was still in my hand, and I'm a quick bastard. I stabbed it up right through the wrist of the hand gripping my neck. The creature screamed, a sound like some sort of dying antelope, and dropped me. Before he could react again, I was slashing at his ankles. Managed to cut what felt like a tendon before he skittered back. Now, the stare down. I was crouched on the ground, he was standing out of reach. Neither of us moved from our spots, he was breathing heavily, smiling slightly, clenching and unclenching his good hand. I'll be using your blood to fix this, he said. Grind up your skull and keep the powder in a jar. Sell your remains to the highest bidder who needs an aphrodisiac. I didn't say anything. I don't speak to the people I'm about to kill. I clenched my knife tighter and stood up. I was in bad shape, but he didn't look much better, like it was taking all of his willpower just to stand on his fucked up leg. There wasn't much space between us. I made a half-hearted attempt to faint. He didn't bite. At this point in a fight, tricks don't do you much. It could only be resolved one way. At the same instant as if a gun had gone off at a track race, we leaped towards each other. I brought my knife up, swinging it with my bad hand. He grabbed my wrist, drove his bleeding hand into my stomach, and twisted his body. It brought me with him. In one second, I went from running forward to being flat on my back, staring at the night sky. He stepped into my vision, grinning. Motherfucker. I lost my knife in the fall. I wasn't sure where it was. He knelt down and wrapped his hands around my throat. I could feel his palms burning my flesh, the temperature of the skin rising and rising. A thin drip of boiling saliva spilled from his teeth and across my cheek. His eyes were bloodshot, wild. He squeezed my throat tighter. 
In situations like this, your best bet is, go for the eyes. The ground we were fighting on was loose dirt and pebbles. I swept two handfuls of them up, hurling them into his face. He winced, but didn't let go. It was all that I needed. Before he could recover his focus on me, I jabbed forward, thumb outstretched. It went right into the jelly-filled socket. Now he let go, roared back, screaming and clutching his face. He began to desperately toss fire around him, but I was already moving, and his blows were too telegraphed. My knife was a few steps away from where I'd landed. I grabbed it, and, with the scream filled with just as much pain as triumph, rushed at him. The blade caught him in the chest and he froze. For a second he just stood there, unmoving. Then, in almost slow motion, he crumpled to the ground, didn't move, didn't breathe. I pulled the knife from his chest and wiped away the blood. Sometimes I take trophies from the people I kill. Pieces of their body. Didn't bother this time. I grabbed his bag of charms from where it had fallen on the ground and began to sprint away. People had seen us fighting. The authorities were probably only a few minutes away from arriving. I had to figure out how to escape this damn city half dead and get home. I did, of course. It's not as interesting a part of the story, probably not what you're looking for. I don't know or care how you found me. What I do know is that I'm leaving for my next hunt in five days. Pay for the rest of my drinks and food before I go, and I'll tell you anything you want. But for now, I need to get up to bed. All this talking makes a man damn sleepy. Maybe if you're still here tomorrow, I'll tell you about the time I accidentally killed the wrong dragon. Black Market Magic by Malice Aforethought. When most people hear time travel, they get antsy. They don't want to hear it. It changes things, and everybody's got things they don't want changed. Even if your past is as black as coal dust, the fact that you're standing there in any position to voice an opinion means you got out. And nobody wants to wake up and find some bastard broke their lucky break. So it's disquieting to find out you can shoot it into your veins. Worse still to know that four decades back you could buy a hit on most streets, at least in the bad parts of those kinds of cities which like to pretend they don't have them. The names changed, the doses changed, but most everything fell into one of two broad categories. Stitch was the worst. Still is, if you can get it. Chemical future, mixed with the self-immolation charge and whatever you call the tachyon equivalent of speed. While you take it, you get reckless. Careless. Eventually, you're either paranoid or dead. Caution saves lives, but Stitch makes it so yours doesn't need saving. Instead of dying, your body burns up and you're kicked back by up to a month, free to make the same mistakes in new and exciting ways. A guy can get used to that, like he gets used to oxygen. When there's nothing on the line, you call every bluff you can find. You start poking tigers for the hell of it, because there's no reason not to. Pain becomes second nature, and death becomes first. You get shot, and stabbed, and blown to bits, and cut into ribbons, and none of it matters, because you'll always come up laughing. And then you hit your tolerance. Stitch works differently to most drugs because it's self-administering. When you're bumped back, your veins are pumped full of it again, like they were the first time. The only way to drain it from your system is to wait it out, let it pass naturally. It usually involves spending several months in a very, very safe location. One wrong move and the charge kicks in and you're burned up, and zip, punted back with a fresh dose. You could theoretically spend an eternity riding that high if you found a reliable way to kick the bucket. But when I say theoretically, I mean it. The human mind doesn't like being rolled over like that, and eventually gets wise. It starts to fight back. Consider that, when you live the same day over again, your mind is the only thing changed. You've got the same stuff in your veins, the same brain in your skull, but your mind, the essential you, is a version of you which already lived the next couple of weeks of events. After a while, your psyche learns to ignore the chemical soup swimming in its arteries, and it suppresses the neurological triggers which tell the immolation charge to blow. You become a dud, still high, still rocking the slow-burning amphetamine lifestyle, but mortal. Unless you find a new way to burn yourself out from the inside, you don't get any more do-overs. And that hurts. Not literally, because usually by that point you spend enough time in terminally painful situations, 
that you're numb to most kinds of actual pain. But the knowledge that you can die, that your next false move could be your last, it's difficult to grasp. Usually it doesn't take, or the user doesn't realize what's happening to them. They die quickly and unceremoniously, like everyone else does. It's often ruled a suicide, or close enough for the cops, since it's hard to imagine a sane person getting into such a recklessly risky situation. If they don't die, they're clued in by some near miss, something which should have sent their brain into a panic, should have triggered the charge, but doesn't. They'll start rapidly tallying up their loops, counting the seconds they've relived, trying to come to some kind of total, trying to work out just how much extra time they've spent. It usually takes about six months to hit tolerance, in personal time. Of course, if you mainline stitch during a plane crash, those months can be about three minutes for everyone else. It depends on the dosage and the user and a lot of other stuff, but regardless of what the threshold is, beyond it, you're on borrowed time, and I mean that with absolutely no pun intended. Once you get used to Stitch, there's no going back. You get paranoid. You start yearning for that safety net. The days stretch out as you notice every hidden danger that could spell your end. Your last end, not like all those ends which ended up not happening. Pain goes from being an enemy conquered to a friend sorely missed, because it's hard to stay safe when your body can't give you warning signs. The addiction is cruel and self-defeating. You won't even want to leave the house, much less find yourself a temporal methadone. Maybe you'll get over it one day, and learn again the lesson that a life without risk is not one worth living. Most likely not, but stranger things have happened. It's not important. What's important is that Stitch kills, and it kills quick, and it kills in big, stupid accidents with a lot of collateral damage. And despite those accidents, it's no less attractive a prospect. People will always want it, and it'll always take them for a ride. Compared to Stitch, normal drugs are quiet and harmless. And you can't arrest a dead guy for possession, which gave the board a motive to crack down on it. And crack down they did. To picture the Nostrum board, picture an office block a hundred miles from anywhere important, stained gray by the passage of a thousand starch-stiffened lives. Everyone working there is the same, more or less. They all have the same shallow eyes, the same forced disinterest, the same soft ablation of ambition. Paperweight workers in overcast suits who shift and shuffle their way up through the system until they vanish at the top of a puff of smoke perpetual motion bureaucracy, bubbling a smog of legislature just dense enough to keep it going without upsetting anything important. Then add Stitch, infamous killer, public menace, and really big problem for the office jockeys. It's something important, and something that desperately needs upsetting. It's like cancer to the board's finely tuned anatomy, pulling the remnants of activity together into a kind of organizational tumor disrupting everything. It grows. It doesn't stop growing, it begins to distribute itself through the board, siphoning time and energy in great heaving breaths. It's gross and it's inefficient, but it's powerful as hell and very difficult to get rid of. So they come down hard on Stitch, harder than they've come down on anything before or since. They launch brigades, task forces, and a man with fake hair and a smile to match who shows up at my door with a warrant and one of those bright ideas that you can tell somebody else was very proud of. It should be obvious that I was in no position to refuse. Which brings me, in a roundabout way, to Nick. It's the other kind of time travel, the one the board now keeps mostly under wraps. It's in the same chemical family as Stitch, but with a lot more amphetamine and a lot less combustion. Instead of sending you back, it compresses your personal time whenever your body goes into fight or flight, giving you up to two hours for every minute. Your reflexes are effectively unlimited. You can see a crime scene for a moment and know it better than you know your own bedroom. Withdrawal is hard, but there's no retroactivity, and if the cravings are bad, you can always keep dosing. There are, of course, side effects. I can't drink, I can't smoke, and I sleep for four months of the year. The board watches me like a hawk, and there's a camera in every room of my house. If I ever stop receiving my discreet little sachets of time, I'll go into a deep shock which could last a subjective infinity. But in exchange for all that, I can win every fight, 
I can walk into a lab packed with the kind of people you'd expect and still come out the other side with nothing more than a crick in my neck. I can shoot 12 people in 6 seconds, and some of those with the same bullet. I can bust rings dealing stitch, of course, but also others. Pyromaniacs hopped up on Lady Blaze, back alley priests trading holy water and shots of five. Addicts taking gaze to open their third eye, and crooks peddling B to keep it shut. Oim tank annihilated diamorphine. If it's been a slow day, I might stoop to coke. They took stitch down, but the initiative's too weak to stop. Drugs kill. But so do I, and I do it better. I do good work for the board, and I ride the wave of that work as far as it'll take me. Yes, I'm on a leash, and I can't escape that without earning myself some severely unwanted attention. I'm tracked, traced, and everything short of shackled. But in the confines of the gutter, in those dark puddles of neon and blood, I'm a god. And of course, there's always the package, tucked and taped in the crook of my arm. I'm hooked on Nick, so a canula made perfect sense. Needles can be risky, and the board was more than willing to cover the cost. Nobody wants their personal weapon getting infected, do they? It's easy enough to switch one packet for another. Even with Nick, I'm not perfect. Sometimes I need to do over. And that's all I have for you today. Come, you look. What's the word? Ah, sleepy. Have my stories bored you such? No, no, I just... It's quite alright. You little things need your rest. Hop off, this is the place. Wonderful, isn't it? A nice little nest to cozy up in. Go on and drift off. When you wake up, you'll be able to find your way back to the main hall. Just pick a direction and start walking. Until then, good night, wanderer. Restful dreams.